Welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue looking at some of the physics involved in martial arts. Uh, this video is going to pick up where we left off in our last video, so if you haven't seen that one, I recommend you check that out first because a lot of what we're going to go over today is going to build upon what we discussed in our first lesson. Uh, so today we're going to look at the role that time plays in determining impact force, and we're going to try to better understand if time is something that we can manipulate to maximize our impact force. Uh, there's a common question, and I, and I have a belt here to actually illustrate for you. Uh, there's this common concept in martial arts that because when we're whipping, if, if I snap this belt, you can see that if I swing my hand out, the belt's going to extend, but if I swing my hand out and I snap it back right away, you hear a much louder pop. So we're going to explore some of the physics that's involved in determining impact force, see where time comes into play, and then we're going to come back and look at this example a little bit more and try to better understand uh, what exactly is going on here. So you can take this for now. Why don't we get started? As I said, we're picking up where we left off last time, and last time we discussed Newton's second law that tells us if there is a net force acting on an, on an object, on a mass, then that mass will experience an acceleration. And of course, this is a vector equation, but we're not going to really concern ourselves with vectors today. So many times you may see me just leave the vector arrows off. But this is Newton's second law. And the important thing to take from here, or from this equation, is that this is telling us that if a net force acts on a mass, not that this is the force that a mass with a given acceleration will exert or to deliver. So this tells us the force that's acting on the mass. We also looked at last time momentum, which is simply determined if you know the mass and the velocity, momentum is the product of the two. So momentum is mass times velocity. Uh, now, with these two equations and understanding what acceleration is, which is simply determined if you know the final speed and you subtract the initial speed and you know the time that that change in speed occurred, that's your acceleration. And, and look at that. We have that, uh, that time variable that we're looking for. So let's take this and we're going to plug it into Newton's second law. And what you'll find, I'm not going to do the math out, but what you'll find is now we can rewrite Newton's second law in terms of momentum. And now Newton's second law tells us that the net force acting on an object is equal to the change in momentum, the final momentum minus the initial momentum divided by the time that it took for that change in momentum to occur. Now this makes sense, doesn't it? If I apply a force to a mass, that mass will accelerate. If that mass is accelerating, its velocity is changing, therefore its momentum is changing. And now we can look at Newton's second law, as I said, in terms of time. Uh, and to better understand this, well, we've all heard the saying, it's not the fall that kills you, it's a sudden stop at the end. If you experience a change in momentum in a very small period of time, if you experience, in fact, a large change in momentum in a very small period of time, it's going to be a very large force involved that caused that change in momentum. Uh, let's look at another example. Let's imagine that there's a cart in this room and that for all intents and purposes, uh, this cart has some initial momentum and its final momentum, well, I'm going to apply a force to the cart to bring it to rest, so its final momentum is zero, so its change in momentum is just the mass times the initial speed, okay? And for all intents and purposes, friction, air resistance, all of that is negligible. So this cart is sliding across the room, and I have Justin here to help out. He's going to step out in a minute, uh, but let's imagine he's watching this. We're doing a little experiment. This cart is sliding across the room. It has some initial momentum, and then I come along and I apply a force to that cart. Well, we know that the net force acting on an object equals its change in momentum over the time it took for that change to occur. In this case, because all other forces we said are negligible, then the net force is the force that I'm applying and the change in momentum because we know that I'm, I'm going to apply a force until I bring this cart to rest, until it's not moving anymore. So the change in momentum is just the mass times that initial speed or velocity. We're just looking at this in a one-dimensional case, so we don't have to worry about the vectors. 
uh, and then we divide by the time it took. So now Justin's watching this. This cart has some initial momentum. I apply a force. It takes me 10 seconds to bring that cart to rest, and Justin says, I think I can do better. So now, ideal case, we're able, remember this is a thought experiment, we're able to bring the, that cart to the exact same momentum. Justin steps in, and he brings that cart to rest in five seconds. Well, if the change in momentum remained the same, but the time changed, what changed that allowed him to bring the cart to rest quicker? He must have applied a larger force. And that's, that's how this works. So time now we see plays a role in determining how large a, a force we generate. The next question then that you might ask is, well, can I manipulate this? Can I make the time decrease? And the answer is no. And I'm going to show you why. Let's have Justin step out here now. See, this cart example I shared with you is actually uh, very much the same way we're going to analyze right now, striking Justin. Now, this is a very simplistic model. There's a lot more going on. Uh, but this will suffice so that we can understand what the physics is telling us at the conceptual level. Um, so in this example, there's some mass that's in motion. And a force comes along and it brings that mass to rest. If I'm fighting Justin, okay, if, if I throw a punch, let's start with a strike to his midsection. We'll talk about the role targets can play in this analysis in a little bit. But if I throw a strike to his midsection, uh, if, if I'm fighting a bigger guy especially, I think it's pretty safe to say I have some effective mass that's in motion and then that collides with my opponent and it's reasonable to say that my opponent brings that mass to rest. Isn't that our cart example? And the reason that we can use this analysis is because if we look at the force that Justin applies to me to bring my mass from whatever initial momentum it has, it brings it to rest. Well, whatever force he's exerting on me, Newton's third law tells us for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and therefore he's exerting that force on me and I'm delivering that same exact force into him. Okay, so that's our example, but now you might say, well, if I throw a punch and I throw a quick punch and snap it back, you know, drive through a little but snap it back as quick as possible, that I've decreased the time of impact and I've therefore maximized the force. But that's not what this is telling us. See, in this example, there was only one force acting on the cart, so the force is equal to the change in momentum over time. Now, in our instant, or in our, our case, when I'm striking Justin, now there's another force that's coming into play. It's as if there is now another force that's pulling on this cart, pulling it back, maybe a tension, a rope that's a a, a tied to the cart that somebody's pulling now back on the cart as I imp impact with it or Justin impacts with it to bring it to rest. So now F does not equal mv over t. Now we have a new equation because remember, what does Newton's second law tell us? It's the net force that is equal to the change in momentum over time. So now it would be whatever that tension force plus the force I'm applying is equal to the change in momentum over time. So certainly We've now decreased our time, but we've added another force, and that force is coming from us, not Justin. He's certainly absorbing some of my momentum, and he's delivering a force that's, that's taking away some of that, that initial momentum. But now when I withdraw, that's not him, that's me. Uh, another thought experiment to illustrate this, think of a, a car. Think of two identical cars crashing into a wall. Now in one case, maybe the, the driver is unconscious, the car is driving constant momentum right on impact, they don't hit the brakes, they're unconscious. The other car, the moment of impact, the, the driver's slamming on the brakes. Is the impact time gonna be less? Most certainly. Is it going to increase the force that the wall delivered? No. Did it increase the net force? Yes. If the time decreases, the net force has to increase. If the time decreases here, the net force has to increase. But that net force, or that increase in force, is not coming from my opponent. So it's important to understand that. Could you grab that belt for me, please? So now let's go back and look at this, this principle of wave energy. And, and uh, wave energy definitely applies within our martial arts techniques. There are many different ways that you can deliver your strikes. And we look at whipping 
uh, very often in our training, actually, because part of our training and part of our curriculum derives from Shaolin Muay Kran Kung Fu, which is uh, it implements a great deal of shaking or whipping power. So that's exactly what this is. When I'm whipping this belt out, well, I'm sending a wave of energy down the belt. And what determines how hard this belt uh, hits, what determines how, uh, how painful the, the impact is if you get whipped with something? Well, it, it's, the, it's what we've been talking about in our first couple of lessons. It's the, the speed. See, when I'm whipping, I could certainly, I could swing the belt out and I could let the, way, the energy, the wave of energy travel down the end of the belt and it could hit a target. Or I could snap back and it's not the snap back, it's not this hitting the target and pulling back right away that makes the whip so painful. It's the way that the, the waves that I'm generating, the wave energy that I'm sending down, in this case the belt, it could be a whip, but it's the way that the waves work together to add energy to the belt so that this speed in the end on impact is much larger. Mythbusters has a video, uh, you can probably find it on YouTube, they did a a uh, little exploration into whipping a towel and they were whipping a block of ice. Now they got that towel, they clocked it. They got the towel going up over uh, 150 miles an hour I believe. It was definitely over 100 miles an hour. Now a bull whip, there's different ways that you can swing the whip to get energy down the end of the whip. But the reason the whip is so devastating is a bull whip can actually break the sound barrier. The end of the whip is actually traveling over 700 miles an hour. Again, the devastating nature of whipping is in the impact velocity. Now in our techniques, we, we emphasize that. You want to maximize your mass and maximize the velocity of that mass. And there's roles that, that energy plays in this and we can talk about that in a future video. So there's, there's a little more analysis that goes in here, but hopefully now you understand timing is certainly something we can manipulate. And in fact, I'm going to have Justin step back out here. It is something that we should manipulate. Because let me ask you this, do we always want our opponent to absorb all of our momentum? Uh, and should we retract our strikes as fast as possible? Certainly. Even if I'm burying my strike in him and letting him absorb the whole impact to maximize the impact force, I'm still going to withdraw that strike fast so that I'm on guard and ready for my next move. But what about targets? If, for instance, he's on guard, let's have you on guard for a second, if I'm punching him in the face, how quick, based on this impact, the effective mass I'm hitting with, I might be stepping through, if it's my backhand, front hand, doesn't matter, but let's not just think about the mass that we're striking with, what about the effective mass of the target that we're hitting? How quick is his head going to fly away from that strike? Now if it does, should I continue to bury my fist into nothing? Uh, another concept here goes back to a Kempo principle, major and minor movements. Not every movement is a major movement, and I can't bring all my energy or all my momentum into every movement. And we also want to be set up for follow-up movements. So I encourage you, now that you have a better understanding of some of the physics, look at collisions. We've all experienced at some point, I'm sure, car accidents, or we've played billiards, and you see how the, the balls, how you can strike one ball to sink a shot, but at the same time, you might do what? You might glance that ball, glance your cue ball rather, off of the other ball to set up for another shot. So if we look at, for instance, say we have a mass, could be a ball, could be our fist, and now it's colliding with another mass, so its velocity is coming in perhaps at, let me draw that a little more clear, at a glancing angle. So now we have this. So now what does that mean? Well, it means that part of the energy is going this way, part of the energy is going this way. So some of it, or some of the momentum, is going into the target, but some of it can be used, as is, a, is the case in many of our techniques, some of that energy can be used to carry us into any number of follow-up strikes. Okay, so, what's, what's the moral of the story? What's the main lesson? Time is something that you can manipulate, but be wise in your manipulation of time because there's an appropriate time to bury your strike or thrust your strike into the target. There's an appropriate time to use snapping strikes, glancing strikes. There's many more concepts that we can get into. Time can also be manipulated as a byproduct of your method of delivery. 
So sometimes you snap the strike back when we're using whipping strikes just because of the way that we're delivering the strike, it's already snapping back on impact. Uh, so time can be manipulated, but consciously deciding to shrink time is not going to maximize your impact force. Okay? So that's the lesson. Understand the role that impact force and time, how they work together. Uh, understand when is appropriate to manipulate it. I'm going to leave that up to you. Just explore your techniques and there's plenty of lessons and applications of this within your techniques. This is just the physics behind why everything is set up the way it is. All right, that'll be it for this lesson. I hope you guys enjoyed and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. We'll see you soon.